Speaking of Sister Donna, pray for her, man, that right. she, she needs prayer. God needs to perform the miraculous yeah, healing. Yeah. If you're wondering why she looks a little puffy this morning, it's not because Derek beat her up. It's just because she was trying to lift weights in, in a very crazy way. And concrete always wins. Somebody say amen. 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 So, we, we, man, we love you. We love you. We can't wait till you're back here worshiping with us. And Alex, you're the same way. Can't wait till you're back here worshiping with us. And Brandon's at this meeting. Amen again. But we're going to do um, a, a special request. And um, Matthew's going to sing it. And he has absolutely no voice. And I'm going to fiddle around with it on the guitar. And I think we ran through it once. So this is going to be beautiful. But for Sister Lou, who asked for this song um, six months ago. Uh, we were holding on for Guitar Sunday, and we didn't forget about you. We were just waiting for the right moment, and um, clearly today is not it. But we're gonna we're gonna do this for you, and, and then when he gets better, we'll do it again. I'll figure it out somewhere. <laughs> Oh, my, my Savior, that's enough to make me 
Because his birthday was last Wednesday. Oh. Oh. Sister Kathy Meter's birthday, she's not here this morning, but it was last Wednesday as well. And next Wednesday is... So I would just want you to come on up here and pass you, you come on up here. Can you come on up here? I know you got a birthday at the end of the month. We'll take time for you at the end of the month. And Sister but I got a job for you to do. Give me that look. I figure if we're going to take time, we might as well take time. So we're going to see you have your birthday for the next few hours. And I want you to pray a little bit. That God will bless you for the next year. I can't think of a better person to do it than you. Amen.
fortunes you say me. You seem indeed. Looking up toward heaven, tears falling from his face. He cried, My God, I just don't know. Sorry for the humor, but I wrote it and I can't play it. We're going to try it. Looking up toward heaven, tears falling from his face. He cried, My God, I just don't understand. As I look into the mirror at the line of your disgrace, all I see. Yeah. 
same time that he's before the judge.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to surrender to you. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. You can be seated. We're going to let the kids go back at their time. Remember? 10.30? Sunday morning, worship, 9.30, Sunday school, Thursday night at 7 o'clock. We're in the book of Hebrews. And we're going to let the kids go to their time together too. Thank you. Uh, this morning. And I'm, I'm excited about what Jesus is doing and, and how he's doing it within our life. Uh, I almost feel rusty. It doesn't seem like a long time. Yeah. How many of you know Jesus is good? His mercy endureth forever. Aren't you glad he's got mercy? God, He loves us, He cares for us, wants to do things for us, minister to us, touch our hearts, our lives. See, even though I, I may feel rusty, I feel excited. Because God has given me the privilege to share the word with you. I have a, such a sense this morning of, of who Jesus is. And I want to share with you, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 through 10. And that's where we're going to start. But I want to share with you <coughs> what Jesus is in view of the creation in Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3. And uh, I hope you brought your dinner because we'll be here until about 9 o'clock. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> Jesus is real. In the same Jesus who created this world wants to create in us something magnificent, something powerful, and something lovely. The question is, will we let him? You are a new creation this morning. And by that I say simply this. You are something special. Look at somebody else and say the words you've been wanting to say, whether it be spiritual or physical. Or anything. Just look at somebody right next to you and say, ain't I something? Okay, now, now look at them again and say, in the spiritual, not the natural. Ain't I something? Ain't I something? You are something in the spiritual. God got a hold of my life and he won't let go. When God gets a hold of your life, he will not let go. There are people this morning who are running from the presence of God, and God's got a hold of their life, and it's like they got suspenders on, and he grabs those suspenders and come back here. And I'm going to tell you something. There was a day when I was younger that suspenders were in. Some of you, you older folks know what I'm talking about. And I remember I, I used to run around doing stuff like that, and somebody would grab a hold of that X on that suspender without me knowing it. And I'd be taken off and all of a sudden I couldn't go anyplace. And I couldn't do what I wanted to do. That's like the presence of God when he grabs you. And you start to take off to do something that you don't need to do. He says, okay, it's time to stop. I want to stop you. I want to make you something real and different in Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 through 10. Let me read this. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now let me tell you something here, and I'm just going to bring a, a couple side notes as I read this, because I want you to know something. I want to make it perfectly clear. But to each one of you, every one of you, grace was given. Okay? 
according to Christ's gifts. Not according to your gifts. Christ's gift is infinite, eternal, powerful, and greater than we can ever imagine. Well, I don't have many gifts. I don't have many talents. It's not your talent that God desires. It's His talent flowing through your life that He desires. Therefore, He says, when He ascended on high, He led captivity captive. You are free this morning. You no longer have a captive. Don't use the excuse that the devil's all over me because he's under your feet. Don't use the excuse that, oh, the circumstances are just terrible because you can take authority over the circumstance through Jesus Christ. He led captivity captive and he gave gifts to men. What gift did He give? He gave you the keys to the kingdom of heaven and earth. If you don't unlock the door, it's not His problem, it's yours. How many of you got a key to your house? You lock the door. I got a key in my pocket. Fits a lot, but I just don't know if I'm going to unlock it. I'm just going to stand outside here all day long. Well, no, what we do is what? We pick up, the first thing we do is find our key and put it in the lock and open it up. Well, why can't we do that with Jesus? Why are we so concerned about the physical house that we live in and neglect the spiritual house that God's given us? The gift of God. Now this he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. And he who descended also is the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. Now I want you to turn to somebody and say the words you wanted to say to some people. Man. Come on, man. Man. You're full of it. Of it. See, now some of you thought something other than where I'm going, okay? Because when you said, man, you're full of, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. No, you are full of the presence of God because the Word says He fills all things. What are you doing with it? What are you doing with it? was the creator of the universe. Jesus fills all things. He can fill us and has filled us with his gifts and his glory. British, British author H.G. Wells said it best, and, and, and listen to what he says. He says, I'm not a historian. I'm not even a believer. But I must confess that a historian, his name is Jesus, this penniless preacher from Nazareth, is irrevocably the very center of history. Jesus Christ is easily the most dominant figure in all of history. If we study the history of creation in the light of the New Testament, we will discover that everything in this visible creation is an image of Jesus Christ. I began to go through Genesis chapter 1 through 3, and I just picked out a few things. As far as the New Testament goes, if you have your Bible, you, we're going to go through several scriptures. If you don't, they'll be up here. Write them down. You can look at them later. First was in Genesis 1-3. God said, let there be light. Great. In John chapter 8, verse 12, it says, Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. 
You know, we sing a lot of songs. Created me a clean heart, oh God. Renew our right spirit within me. God has already created light in you. Your ball is either on or burnt out. Which is it? And if your bulb is burnt out, you need to change it. <coughs> Jesus is the light of the world. And just as God in the beginning created the light, He created light for us in the New Testament. Genesis 1.6 And God created the firmament and the water, the firmament. What is the firmament? Something visible. He created the water. What does the New Testament say? John 4.10, Jesus answered and said unto her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says it to you, give me the drink, you would have rather asked him, and he would have given you living water. Living water. Living water. Water. See, when God created the heavens and the earth, he said, okay, I'm going to create the waters now, and, I'm, and there, he put that little word firmament in there. You know what it means? Something visible. Something visible. You can see it. Now let me ask you this. Jesus said, if you knew who asked me, the woman at the well. The woman at the well is full of what? Sin. She was hurting. She was bothered by all the stuff that was going on in her life. She'd been married several times. She couldn't even go to the well at the same time of day as the other women whine because she was such an outcast. She was the <coughs> lowest of the low. And Jesus walks up to her and he said, listen, if you knew who said this, you would have asked me and I would have given you rivers of living water. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter how you've lived before right now. Get it right with Jesus, make it right with Jesus, and let the water of His Spirit wash you clean. I uh, took a shower this morning. I hope most of you did, but when, when, I, when I took a shower this morning, I just stood under that, and I just stood under that hot water and I said, oh, I just feel so warm. And you say, I, want, I just want to stay here for a while and enjoy the water. Let me tell you something. When Jesus moves in your heart and you begin to surrender to him and you begin to give everything to him, that water, that living water, you just want to stay in the shower of his water, in the shower of his love, in the shower of his blessing, and let him wash away everything that's impure. God never called any one of us to be sinless. Hear me. God never called any of us to be sinless because we were born in it. There's only one that he called to be sinless, and that's Jesus. Don't let Satan tell you a lie that you cannot overcome what the devil has prepared for you. Because you can. You are more than an overcomer. The water of his glory. John chapter 7, verse 38. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. See, that living water is not only a gift, it's a never-ending fountain. It's that fountain. 
Then I went down to Genesis chapter 1, verse 11. Where it talks about bringing forth life, bringing forth the grass, bringing forth life, bringing forth the living things. And in John 15, 1, where he says, I am, Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. As the Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. Two things happen when you're living in the vine. One of them is as you grow and you mature in Christ Jesus, and you that have been walking in, in Jesus for a long time, listen to me right now. You ready? You will grow some branches that will die off. And they need to be broken off and trimmed off so new life can come. Because if you leave a plant or a tree or a thing that is living and it grows out dead, the death will take your life away. So you need to be pruned every once in a while. Well, the Lord will do that. And he will mature you. He will cut away all the dead stuff. And you know what happens when he cuts away all the dead stuff? New life, even greater life, grows. And then the second thing that happens is one that we're working on right now. I have... My, my family loves... My house loves plants. I have two. Three. Or three, yeah, three that really mean something to me. Two of them came from my mom's funeral. But one of them is this stupid little cactus that I went and bought, and it was about this high when I bought it. And that was a year ago. That little cactus now is three foot high. But there was something that happened. Everybody would come by, oh, that's a neat cactus, that's a neat cactus. I want a cactus like that. And there was this little thing that started to come out of the bottom of the cactus, and there's several more, I, th I believe, on it right now. But we said, okay, how are we gonna do this? And we went and talked to the guy, and he says, okay, what you do is you cut it off, and you place it in a plant, and you let it root, and it will become a cactus as strong as the first one. It will give birth, the oak, the cactus that you have will give birth to a new one. Now think about that. You, as you grow in Christ, things will come out of you that will be cut off in people that you can plant, that they might become strong in the Lord. You will multiply. Now I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself because the end of Genesis says what? Go and what? Multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. Now that first cactus is already spoken for. Okay, so don't come and ask me for it. But there's a few others coming. What I'm saying to you is simply this. When Jesus comes, and his life comes, his light comes, his water comes, you begin to be fruitful. And you begin to multiply. You begin to tell people about Jesus. And I don't mean doing what I seen the other day. I, I, I wanted to get out of the car. Every time I, I see these people that do this, I just I said I, I was with somebody and I said that very same thing. I just want to get out of the car and slide. But there's somebody holding the sun on the street corner. Instead of holding the sign, put the sign down. Go to somebody one on one and tell them what Jesus has done in your life. Everybody knows that Jesus is Lord. Now what does that lordship have to do with you? Jesus didn't hold a sign up 
saying, hey, come. I'm, I'm, I'm the Lord of all. No, what did he do? He went to people. He spoke to people. One on one in, in a lot of situations. He just spoke to them and he said, hey, this is what Jesus has for you. And in that creation experience, he become the true vine. He become true vine. Something that we've been talking about, and I'm using this in my sermon, even though it's an announcement, because the Lord spoke to me about doing it. We've been talking and talking and talking about having a church directory. And we're going to do it. If you don't want your address or phone number or picture, because eventually we're going to have pictures for everybody. Put your pretty little face in the book. As a church directory. A directory that we can take and we can pray for people. But there's more than just that. I, ha I heard this morning something about, hey, we need people to call people when they're not here. Yeah, we do. The problem is we don't have a lot of the numbers. We don't know your number. What does it do? It creates accountability. It creates someone to nurture somebody. It creates a little fertilizer, a little watering, a little help. And then, In Genesis chapter 1, he creates the living creatures. The grain, the grass, the fruit, <clears throat> so that Adam and Eve might what? Eat. And then Jesus... In John chapter 12, verse 24, it says, Most assuredly, I say unto you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Listen to me very carefully. Jesus didn't want to remain and God did not want to remain alone so he sent his son to die that fruit might be what produced and you and I might have fellowship sometimes we got to die to ourselves Paul said, I die daily. It's a hard illustration to understand. But it simply means this. He didn't want to be alone. And he'd rather die for the cause of Christ so that many might live than stand alone with Jesus. I've heard it said, and Please don't say this to me anymore because it drives me up a wall. You ready? I love this little church. Well, this little church doesn't need to stay little. It needs to get big. And it needs to get big with new life and new people wanting and finding Jesus as their Savior and as their Lord. And as we love one another, that the church becomes healthier and it becomes larger. And many people come to the Savior. And don't get don't get me wrong. I like knowing everybody. And and I'm praying that it, as, even if we get large, we know everybody. <coughs> I I stand in amazement every time I go to Chicago and I watch the folks in that large church. Everybody knows everybody. Why? Because they've brought, been brought up, and it's the same attitude that I want to bring up here. You ready? They've been brought up praying for one another. They've been brought up showing accountability for one another. If somebody's not there, they're after their height. 
somebody in the church this morning that I was coming after this week if I didn't see him. I'm like, what do you need to protect the guilty? Somebody was like, okay. But I'm telling you right now, why? Because if you give your heart to Jesus, I'm responsible for you. That's what the Word says. But not only am I responsible for you, but all of us are responsible. Mm -hmm. Go get them. I remember the illustration, and I, I love it, of a young man in, that I knew who gave his heart to Jesus, but was still pulled by the things of the world. And his pastor told him when he gave his heart to Jesus that, listen, I'm responsible now for you. You need to come to church. So the pastor called him the first week. Oh, well, yeah, I'll get there. He called him the second week. Yeah, I'll get there. He called him the third week. I'll get there. The fourth week, 7.30 in the morning, Sunday morning, he was standing on their door, knocking at their door. And the kid says, well, I don't feel like going today. The pastor grabbed him and dragged him to the car, threw him in the car, dragged him to the church and put him in the back seat. This is where you belong. Do we understand each other now? That young man grew up to be one of the greatest preachers in the world. I love his speaking today. Why? Because somebody cared enough to drag him to church. Now, I'm not encouraging you to do that. You might get in a little bit of trouble today. But, because this happened several years ago when you can get away with it. But what I'm saying to you is you need to be the bread of life. Jesus said, John 6, 35, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. You don't birth a baby and not supply a bottle for him every once in a while. Help him out. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. I will make man in our image. Well, listen to me very carefully. When Jesus, or God said this, he created man in his image, sinless. Okay? Christ is the true lamb. John 1, 21, the next day John saw Jesus coming towards him. said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In creation, God created the first Adam. And because of sin... God gave us the second one, Jesus. And the last one this morning is he's the model man. When God created Adam, he created him what? Perfect, sinless, glorious, powerful. Everything that God had to offer, he created in Adam. And when Adam fell, we lost that. So he brought Jesus to us to restore it. Romans chapter 5, verses 14 through 17. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. Turn to somebody again and say, you're full of it. Yeah. 
You're full of it. You're full of the grace of God. Full of the grace of God. <coughs> Aren't you glad you're full of grace? Because when I say, when you turn to somebody and you say you're full of it, you, the first reaction you want is, no, you are full of the grace and the power and the magnificence of the one who gave his life for you. <coughs> and the gift is not life, that which came to the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from the one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. In other words, the gift that the first Adam gave to you and I was sin. Yes or no? Yeah. But the gift that Jesus gave was life and more abundantly. The gift that the first Adam gave was condemnation. The gift that Jesus has given you and I today is there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Walk in freedom. Walk in forgiveness. For by, by one man's offense, death reigned through one. Much more, those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. You can reign in the gift of righteousness, the abundance of grace, and the power of his love through Jesus. And again in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 49, 7 through 49. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As with the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. But as is the heavenly man, so are those who are heavenly. Can I tell you something? You are a new creation created in what? Christ Jesus. And we have borne the image of the man of dust. We shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. You bear <coughs> the image of the flesh. Amen? Amen? We're all getting older as we see. March is a big month. Big birthday month. <coughs> We're all getting older. We bear the image of the flesh. But let me tell you something. When this flesh is gone, I'm going to dance on streets of gold. I'm going to walk with Jesus. And I'm going to be walking with Jesus before the devil knows I'm gone and my feet get cold. Because I will bear the image of the heavenly man. How about you? Come on, bear. I do. In a matchless metaphor, Tertullian that he was an early Christian writer, wrote that Christ, or the Logos, pervades the world in the same way as honey in the comb. This shouldn't surprise us, since the whole re world created order was created by, in, through, and for Jesus. And the whole creation groans for Jesus to deliver it from the bondage of corruption and to fill it with his infinite goodness. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, 19-23, For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption 
into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Would you turn to somebody and say, I am delivered. I am delivered. From the bondage of corruption. I am, I am walking, walking in the glorious liberty, the glorious liberty. As, a child of God. as a child of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains together until now. God is birthing something in you. I listened last week as Derek and went through the last few weeks this time of, I can't wait to my first grandson. I can't wait to my first grandson gets here. And then we find out that his daughter goes in labor. And they're over in Des Moines with, in the labor room and the baby wouldn't come out. And what was the attitude? <laughs> Come on! Get it moving! And his daughter got so tired, I gotta tell you this story because it's, it's, it's almost hilarious. His daughter got so tired, she's on that gurney getting ready to birth this baby and she says, I quit. <laughs> I'm not telling you, I quit! And her mother-in-law, thank God it was her husband's son, turned to her, looked at her real sternly, and said, You ain't quitting now! You're going to get this baby out of you! <laughs> I wish I could have had the recording to play. Why do I say that? Some of you! God is birthing something in you, and it's getting hard, and it's getting trial, and it's getting trouble. And he wants to birth something new within you, and you say, I quit. And God say, no, you ain't. Get it out. Let it be birthed. So you can grow up into what he wants you to be. God is constantly birthing in us. Something new and something real and something different. Not only that, but we also have the first fruits of the Spirit. You have Jesus walking with you. You have the Holy Spirit walking with you. You have the power of God walking with you. Don't get discouraged. And don't cry when you fall, mess up. Fall down and mess up. Why? When a baby learns to walk, he falls. And what do you got to do? Encourage him to get back up and go at it again. He falls again. Get back up and go. I'm going to encourage you until you learn not to fall. And that's what we need to do with one another. We need to encourage one another until we learn not to fall. That even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly awaiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. I want you to know something. I love Jesus. And I love you. And whether I'm here serving Jesus with you, or whether I'm up there dancing in the streets of gold with him, I will always love the one who saved me from the despair that I was in. There's a song called The Law of the Lord. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 9, or I'm sorry, Psalms, Psalms. chapter 19. Psalms chapter 19. <coughs> See, the four things that God does in creating you, is the first thing he does is he converts the soul. Right? The second thing he will do for you is he will make wise the sinner. The third 
thing he will do to you is bring to you a rejoicing heart. He will bring joy. He will restore joy. The fourth thing he will do is he will enlighten your eyes. And the fifth thing that he will do is he will cause you to have an understanding that this is eternal. It endures forever. I want you to listen to this song real quick. And understand, Psalms chapter 19, it comes right from the Word, verses 7 through 10. I promised me it would come up. It, it's an everlasting hold. Huh? Come Yes, pray right now because it was coming up really good. Yeah. It's a song. Tell me when you get it. But it simply goes this. The love of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Verse 10, more to be desired of they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine Desired more than gold. He's sweeter than honey in the honeycomb. John the Baptist. When he would eat, think about this. He would go right to the hive and he said, I want something sweet. And he would crack open that hive. And he would break off a piece of the inside of that hive that was flowing with the honey. And he would not only eat the honey, but he would eat the comb. Because the comb is the sweetest part of the honey. Jesus says, Come. All ye who are labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. 
says, come, feed off me. I'm the bread of life. He says, come. If you're hungry, you're thirsty. I have water. So you'll never thirst again. Come. If you're near darkness, I will bring and give you light. If you're here this morning, would you just say, come? Lord, I come. I come. I come to you. I allow you to take over. And when I fall, I ask forgiveness beforehand because I will fall. I don't care who you are. If we're all honest, we all fall. I don't care how long you've been serving Jesus. You'll fall. Get up. Get up. Let him move in your life. Let him have his way. Just as I am. God doesn't ask for anything else.
because the past is the past, it's over, it's forgiven. Now we can walk in freedom, in newness of life. Hallelujah. Jesus. sick or hurting. Okay, as we pray for her, we want this prayer not only just to be for her, but to reach out to every person that you know that's hurting today. And then what I want you to do as God heals, come back and tell us, testify that God did this. Amen? Healing and power of the Holy Spirit. 
right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, right now in the name of Jesus, healing power. Hallelujah. Now, Father, right now we pray for healing. Lord, right now we pray, Lord, that this thing would heal itself and correct itself. And Lord, we also pray for Derek. Lord, that he would not feel guilt over this, even though it's not his fault. Lord, right now we release him from that in Jesus' name. Lord, Satan would tell him that there's guilt there, but Lord, right now we know that that's not true. We will not bow to the lie of the enemy in this situation. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Lord, we right now we just give you thanks. Complete healing from him. In Jesus' name. Father, we take authority over these things. In Jesus' name. Now, Father, all those, Lord, right now who had thoughts of somebody who is sick or hurting, right now, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we pray for them. Lord, right now, by the Spirit, touch them. Lord, you, your hand knows no distance. Your Spirit, Lord, has no inhibitation. And right now, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, complete healing, Lord, for those who are our loved ones, our friends, our work co-workers, whatever they might be, in the name of Jesus, that we would hear that the power of God has brought healing in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Shake somebody while you're friendly. 